Hi everyone, today Aidan and I will be speaking to you about student activism in a newly online university, exploring the impact of online learning and teaching on student movements and student power. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge those that walked before us. We speak to you today from the land of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. Sovereignty of this land was never ceded. We would like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past and present and their continuing connection between our Indigenous colleagues and their lands, waters and sky. In addition, we would like to acknowledge any Indigenous colleagues with us here today from all across the world. Our presentation today is going to cover university changes in a global world, acceleration through a global pandemic, the changing role of activism, and the reimagining of the activist as a partner. To start, it's worth noting that, as with all Australian institutions, the Australian university is formed from colonial British roots. As a result, the Australian university has struggled with its own ideological identity. And now we see the Australian university falling trapped to the same neoliberal ideological structures that dominate the powerful Western regions across the world. So we see the corporatisation of the institution, focus on rankings. We see teaching specialists rather than academics. We see casualised and arguably underqualified workforce. We see high fees of international students, low entry requirements, and importantly, a focus on learning as it relates to vocational outcomes, as opposed to knowledge as a good in and of itself. So rather than loose and natural intellectual thought development, we see focus on this tangible but very basic understandings of employability. We also see cuts to the courses that don't earn money as a result, but which foster intellectual knowledge as a priority or sole aim. Through the neoliberal university, the student is positioned as a customer um, and they're there for credentialing rather than learning. Importantly, the customer is always right and this poses huge implications for teaching staff to give them the grades that they want. So that's a pretty grim picture of the university already. Um, COVID then happened and essentially pulled the trigger to sort of intensify um, that current footing even further. So we see a move to all online teaching and learning um, in the pandemic. While this might just be a temporary fix during a global pandemic, um, we think that a large portion of teaching and learning will continue online. So universities in Australia, particularly those hit hard by drops in student numbers from international students are now struggling to secure adequate funding to continue effective online learning and teaching practice. Now the institutions are opting to adopt further failed neoliberal measures to tighten expenditure, cut staff numbers, reduce students' course choices and reduce uh, reliance on casual employees. Strategically, our universities are driving a change agenda that sees sweeping regressive moves across the sector. So that gives us worse teaching with the disappearance of lectures, um, big online classes, technical problems from both sides. Um, students can't actually work from home, particularly in disadvantaged areas. We're not designing online um, yet. We're just chucking what we already do deliver in an online um, template. Um, and that results in poorer learning as a result. So the students are even less kind of capable of individual and intellectual thought development. Um, working from home is incredibly hard for concentration. Um, working with others is really important as well and that's harder online. Um, the poorer teaching and poorer learning certainly isn't lack of trying, um, particularly with the sort of Damocles hanging over our heads from the vice chancellors. Um, and as a result, we've got incredibly disengaged students um, that do not have that kind of sense of belonging to the university that they should um, or need for their own success um, and the success for each other. So we're no longer fulfilling the promise of higher education as a public good. And we're no longer developing or encouraging these skills in thinking. And this is only compounded through an online learning environment. If we think about how activism relates to this, and we think about the importance of activism as a representation that the university has actually done its job. Historically, we see students protesting about their education in addition to contemporary political issues, really important thought provoking stuff. But this energy now is focused elsewhere. Um, it's focused on their own career development and their own employability skills that they're developing through their university um, degrees. If we quickly acknowledge the um, current protests for Black Lives Matters, uh, Matter, sorry, 
Um, they sit outside of the university context, um, so they don't relate to students' needs per se. Um, so we're going to couch that for today's presentation. We're looking at student activists. So some students do continue to be concerned with their education, but these students tend to be those with an axe to grind, student unionists. Um, they deal with really basic or super visual um, issues like the technical problems of learning from home rather than the importance of their education quality. Importantly, whinging about the technical problems that you're having with an online um, delivery is not activism. So a quick note on activism online, there are several benefits. So we see equity um, in access, particularly for disadvantaged students, this is really important. Um, online campaigns are quick and efficient at spreading messages. They're quantifiable as well, so you can quickly gather a lot of data that you can use to hand over to government officials. Um, but is it just slacktivism? Online activism um, doesn't require any kind of long-term commitment or investment. There's no physical tax, which um, means that there's less um, uh, dedication for you, less commitment to the issue, less in, um, at stake. So there's no substantial or longer term consciousness raising. Do we remember Coney 2012 at this point in 2020? So how do we respond to this very grim picture that I've painted? I'm going to hand over to Aidan now for a little bit of hope. Thanks, Piper. I want to talk now about what the role of the student is in this new higher education world, in this, this online shift um, what does it mean to be a student? And what does the university look like? What is the role of the university in such a context? Before COVID hit, we were starting to see some real shifts in the way that governance was done in universities in Australia. I think following in the footsteps of the work that was conducted in the UK, particularly thinking around the publications from the National Union of Students, um, towards opening up those spaces for student active participation in governance structures. Here we were finally starting to see an inkling towards students being able to access those structures for them to open in a sort of democratic way um, to allow for better representation and in some instances some real access for student power. We were also experiencing this global proliferation of student protest, particularly thinking about uh, climate activism um, and in terms of regressive government decision making. And we're seeing that still now, even in this COVID world. To our minds, this raises some really serious questions around what students can do in higher education and what we're here for as a higher education institution. Now, I just want to point out that I'm going to keep talking about what students can do and what we can do because I think there's sort of this bifurcation in our roles, right? We, can, we are teachers and we are students and so we have real possibility because we're sort of positioned in this wedge between both the teaching camp and the student camp, even if that feels really tenuous to us at the moment as doctoral students. So in addition to all of this disruption, there's been disruption to the regular teaching and learning practices as Piper spoke about. But increasingly, there's been a disruption to those analog jobs in the higher education sector. And arguably, I don't think we were that well prepared for all of this change, all of this tumult. Particularly, I think in terms of thinking about work integrated learning um, and lab work and any of that sort of um, stuff that required being in an, in an on-campus or on-industry um, situation. And notably, there's been a real rise of equity and access issues for students learning in these new spaces, right? So students have had real struggles with getting into those spaces just because of technological issues. But it's also worth acknowledging that students with disadvantaged backgrounds are going to struggle particularly with things like having a reliable internet connection, access to the required technology and things like that, right? So we're seeing this real inequity in the higher education landscape, a real fracture that maybe wasn't quite as present as before. So in light of all of this turmoil, this, this crazy, rapidly changing world, how do we frame partnership? How do we come to see partnership, know partnership, and do it? But I think the first step is framing it, right? What is this thing and how do we get there? And I would argue that we need to have a set of base values before we can even begin having a real conversation about what teaching and learning should be, let alone governance for educational ends. 
And if we only go to universities to become credentialed, how can we even begin to instill the values necessary for partnership, let alone foster that much needed critical epistemology for cultural shifts, right? So how do we enact critical education when we can't even get students to engage in education? And so I think this is where the values piece starts. We need to start there. So the values to get there, and this is drawing from the Student Engagement in Higher Education Handbook. Um, this is a bit of a, a paraphrase quote. So higher education institutions across the world have a responsibility to encourage and nurture student engagement, right? Now student engagement, a bit of a neoliberal buzzword there, but I think I'm gonna argue, and I think that this will highlight that we can use that as a bit of a Trojan horse, okay? So to give students informative, practical, and valuable insight into key national and global agendas and issues. And to ask how students can be empowered to take real responsibility for changing their university education for the better. And I would argue that that's a good starting place, a good baseline, right? So we're thinking about these values. What are the values that we might have? We're sort of asking what our students should be doing or could be doing and then we're looking at that just in the educational context at least first, right? Start with their education, then start to talk about critical change making and that kind of thing. And I think we need to reframe students, particularly in light of all of these global changes. So we need to think, you know, students aren't consumers, but essential parts of the higher education experience. Without students, we are nothing, as many campaign slogans say. Students should have more impact in decision-making and governance of higher education, which must be a community of students and professors who are equally responsible for its quality. This is out of the EU. And I think that really sort of captures it. It's a community, maybe even a community of practice between students, professors, students and academics, students and professional staff, right, who are responsible for its quality, but we're also responsible for the issues that higher education faces together. Everything is coming at it in this meeting of us together in a relationship of some kind. What can it be? And Harriet Swain for The Guardian wrote about um, the changing landscape here. She says, once students were expected to do little more than sit in a few lectures and take notes, no longer. We're now more active learners. We're getting more engaged in presentations and you know, working together collaboratively. But we're also being invited to offer our opinions about what we're being taught, how we're being taught it, and even to make strategic decisions about how universities are run. And that piece, I think, is that essential piece because without strategy, without students being involved in strategy and governance, we're not going to be able to get anywhere with just teaching and learning partnerships. Why partnership? And Michael Fielding argues that it's one way of supporting more genuinely participatory alternatives to the ways of those top-down students as consumers models um, or um, sort of didactic content delivery. It's about engaging students in contemporary issues and getting into that nexus of power and purpose, which is often forgotten in advocacy, right? So when we think about fist in air protest, often issues are pushed to the side, um, people's individual knowledges and understandings are sort of pushed out of the way, cleared out of the way, um, in order to make way for this, you know, um, the protest that occurs. And in education, we can, we can sort of reconceptualize that as the way that um, academics or teaching staff are pushed out of the way by um, the student as consumer model. Importantly, Fielding goes on to highlight power and particularly relationships. And I think relationships is, again, at the heart, it's that, that meeting place at the heart of partnership, is this relationship. And here he says, and I think he captures very eloquently, this idea that when we come together, we need to be treating each other as persons in our own right, as beings with all the distinctiveness and possibility our uniqueness proclaims and the rich commonalities our humanity presumes and requires, right? So when we come into a learning space, lots of these things we do, we set values, we set understandings, we share our, we share and um, our understandings and our cultural knowledge is together and we often unpack and critique a lot of those, right? We come together and we think about that and we value each other in those relationships. And when we start to foster those sets of values, that's when we start to create spaces for genuine change. But it's worth asking ourselves as educators in varying contexts, where does the locus of control reside? And that brings me back to partnership, right? So, for me, I think it, it's a partnered 
approach, right? And that is a way in to critical education in the traditional sense of a radical critical education. Partnership is a way towards that for students who might be more disengaged. Partnership, I think, differently to perhaps just sort of an activist culture is a real way of valuing diverse perspectives. And there's a real increasing focus on valuing diversity, right? Another neoliberal um, buzzword or advancement is valuing diversity, but we're actually genuinely doing that through partnership because we are, as Fielding says, valuing what's in the classroom, what's here with us, and those relationships. It's also a way into authentic real-world learning. When we think about critical education, some of the hallmarks of that are taking outside big political issues, big issues facing the world, and turning them into learning moments, experiences, in order to challenge and unpack that through unique conceptual knowledge, right? So we're sort of addressing that real-world learning buzzword as well. And we're taking all of this student-centered rhetoric and we're using that as an inroad, a bit of a Trojan horse, if you will, for all of these different concepts and values. We're getting that into education by bringing in all of these different ways of thinking and doing in this space. But how do we engage in partnership when students are struggling to engage in learning online, you might ask? Well, that's a good question. And I don't have any sweeping broad advice here other than it's a matter of starting with relationships. And those can feel hard to foster, right? They can be difficult. But even things as simple as an email exchange can start the conversation about values in teaching and learning processes. And again, starting with teaching and learning, things that we can control as students or as tutors, lecturers, we can start those conversations and begin those relationships. Again, democracy is this, this much bigger thing than just a collaborative mechanism. It asks us to have a mutual commitment to freedom, equality, and community. And when we bring those values in together, particularly the community one, right? Because without community, how do we have equality or freedom, right? But when we value that community, we build those relationships, we can get to these spaces. And that requires starting small. There's no magic bullet, but this isn't rocket science. We start with conversations, we start talking to each other and exchanging those values, right? You might set those at the beginning of a class, at the beginning of a topic, right? What values are we going to have here? What are we going to do together? And how are we going to value each other in our relationships? Exchanging information, right? Talking about these ideas. The idea of partnership is a really pervasive one. It's very useful to talk about, but it's not done very well. It's more difficult now because everything's online, but it's still possible. And again, it's so possible because we're involving students at a local level. We're involving them in our classes or we're involving our lecturers in our classes. We're asking them to make changes for us so that we can talk to them about what's important. We're likely to see more teaching and learning online and we can't use that as an excuse to let critical education go, to let partnership go, to let even activism go. We need enlightened common sense, enlightened ways of thinking and doing and acting in this world that are going to continue to work even though we're going to see more and more teaching and learning online. I think we need to build a robust student leadership. We can't depend solely on student unions. We need to instill those critical partnership values towards a critical education, which enables each citizen or each student to have their say, to be heard, and for genuine action to be taken, because without that, we're not achieving anything. We have to start small, but we can start in our Zoom rooms. There's a lot of different models and ways of thinking, and I won't suggest any one. Here's two that come out of Australia. <clears throat> um, I hope that here, however, we have advanced a view of partnership as a localizable, actionable start point for embarking towards critical education. Regardless of your educational context, partnership is possible. All students, all ages, they can engage in partnered ways of working if you start with working with them where they are. The foundations exist and it's up to us as students and academics to embrace partnership opportunities and to work within and against the damaging tide of hegemonic university governance towards those failed economic models. Through partnership, we can change the course of higher education globally. Thank you.